Hi, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech. In this video, I'm going to do an example of a root locus sketch for this loop transfer function. Well, let's play with this a little bit before we start sketching it. Um, why don't we go ahead and create the characteristic equation of the corresponding closed loop transfer function that this came from. We'll need that in a couple places. So let's see, if I substitute this GL into here, and multiply this whole thing, this is equal to zero, by the denominator, what I'll get is s, s squared plus 2s plus 3 plus k equals zero. And I'll just write that out completely. There we go. So there's our, our characteristic equation. And what we're going to be doing with the root locus, of course, is plotting all possible closed loop pole locations for all possible positive values of k. And we'll be using two of the fundamental equations associated with the root locus. And that is that the phase angle of any point S0 on the root locus is equal to some multiple of 180 degrees. Could be plus or minus 180 or 360, etc and the magnitude of the loop transfer function evaluated at any point on the root locus is 1 over k. Actually, we won't be using this one so much, but we will be using that one quite a bit. This is used more during the design phase. Okay, so what do we have here? We have m, the number of zeros of the loop transfer function, is 0, and n, the number of poles of the loop transfer function, is 3. So why don't I go ahead and calculate what those roots are. One of them is easy, that one's at the origin. This one, s squared plus 2s plus 3 equals 0. Well, I can use my quadratic formula for that. And what do I get? Negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 2j. So I'll just call that 1.4j. Since it is a sketch, it's somewhat approximate. And let's go ahead and put all this onto a set of axes and see what it looks like. So we have a k equals 0 point here. And we have k equals 0 points at negative 1 plus or minus 1.4j. So that would be oh, right about there and right about there. So I'll label those as k equals 0 and k equals 0. Now at this point we might as well look at the root locus on the real axis. We have one pole on the real axis and that divides the real axis up into two segments. This one and this one. So if I focus on this one first and I look to the right of that segment and count up the number of poles and zeros on the real axis, I get zero. That's an even number, so there's no root locus. In contrast, over in this segment, uh, look to the right of it, I see one pole on the real axis. That's an odd number, so there is root locus there. So I'll just go ahead and put some hash marks there to remind myself that there is root locus. Now, let's see. How about if I go after some asymptotes? And what I see here is m equals 0 and n equals 3. For the asymptotes, we have this interesting equation that looks like 2 k plus 1 times pi over n minus m. And, um, and those are equal to the angles of the asymptotes. And what we do is we let k go from 0 up to n minus m minus 1. So n minus m is 3, minus 1 is 2. And so we're going to cycle k from 0, 1, and 2. So let's go ahead and do that on another page. So 2k plus 1 pi over n minus m, which was 3. And we're letting k equal 0, 1, and 2. So for k equals 0, we get pi over 3. I'll call that theta 1. And for k equal 1, we get 3 pi over 3, or just pi. I'll call that theta 2 for my second asymptote. And for k equal 2, we get 5 pi over 3, and that's theta 3. So here's 60 degrees, 180, and 300. So we have some asymptotes that make these angles 
and let's see 180 is the real axis 60 is going to look about like this and 300 is going to look about like that now the only thing we don't know is this point and that is the point on the real axis where all these asymptotes intersect and we can find that sometimes we call it sigma by looking at the original characteristic equation let's see the original characteristic equation was s cubed plus 2s squared plus 3s plus k and the way we form sigma is we take the coefficient of the second highest power in s of all the stuff that multiplies k well that's zero minus the coefficient of the second highest power of s of all the stuff that doesn't have k in it so that's two and divide it by n minus m so negative two-thirds well let's put that into our sketch now so at negative two-thirds right about here I'll just put a big dot and now we have some asymptotes let's see this is a square set of um, uh, grid points so I can actually draw these asymptotes at 60 and about like so and negative 60 or 300 degrees about like so and right down the real axis like that so there's my asymptotes the asymptotes of course are lines in the complex plane that the root locus converges to or perhaps lies on when k goes to infinity so at the ends of my asymptotes at the end of these rainbows I can just label them as k equal infinity points and a bit of information has now revealed itself. We know that the root locus leaves from these two points, those two k equals zero points, and somehow it gets over here into the right half plane, and we can see the asymptote crossing the imaginary axis. So clearly my root locus is going to cross the imaginary axis. So let's go ahead and calculate that using a Routh array. Here's the original characteristic equation again and I'll just stick that into our Routh array and find a value of k that will yield a auxiliary equation. Then we'll solve that auxiliary equation to tell us where on the real axis or the imaginary axis the root locus crosses. So 1, 3, 2, and k. 6 minus k over 2, that's that minus that, divided by this. And I get 0 there. I find a value of k that makes this row all zeros. That's 6. Now I form the auxiliary equation from this row. 2s squared plus k equals 0. Of course, the roots of this are also roots of the original characteristic equation up here. That's pretty interesting. And what we can now do is substitute that value of k into the, into the auxiliary equation, solve for s, and those are the points on the imaginary axis where the cross occurs. So 2s squared plus 6 equals 0, s squared equals negative 3, and so s is equal to plus minus the square root of 3j. Well, that's roughly one point plus minus 1.7j. So let's put that into our sketch. Let's see, 1.7. That would be very close to where I have these um, asymptotes going through. So right about there and right about here. Now it's likely that I didn't put those asymptotes at nice 60 and 300 degree angles but it is a sketch so we'll just leave it the way it is and work with it the last thing to find is the angles of departure from these k equals zero points that's the angle that the root locus leaves the k equals zero points in other words does it go like this does it go like this or do something else equally strange so let's go ahead and sort that out so I'll re-sketch what we have so far. And what we'll do is, is pick on this k equals zero point, and I'll use the phase relationship, that the phase angle of the loop transfer function at any point on the root locus is some multiple of 180 degrees. And now I'm just going to imagine a 
point on the root locus just very close to that k equals zero point. So we'll draw an angle up to it from these two, call this theta p1, call this one theta p2, and imagine that I have a theta p3 buried inside that uh, k equals zero point area. Using this equation, it's the phase angles of the zeros minus the phase angles of the poles, so I have zero minus theta p1 minus theta p2 minus theta p3 equals 180. Well, let's see, theta p1 is 90 degrees. Theta p2 is, I'll break it up into two pieces. How about 90 plus the inverse tangent of this minus or this over this. So that would be 1 over 1.4 minus theta p3 equals 180. And I can solve this. Let's see, I have minus 180 minus the inverse tangent of 1 over 1 1.4. That's about 35.5 minus theta p3 equals 180. Um, I'll bring this over here, bring that over there. So I have minus 360 minus 35.5 equals theta p3. Um, I can always have multiples of 360, so I can get rid of that. And now I see that theta p3 is equal to negative 35.5. And we can sketch that. So my angles of departure at minus 35.5, see negative 45, that's easy to pick off. So it's about like this. And this one would be similar. About like that symmetric about the real axis. So I have all the information I can possibly get. Here's a k equals zero point. I have root locus on the real axis. So this one is just going to do this very boring thing and scoot along here on the real axis as k is increased. These two on the other hand do something a little bit more interesting. They leave like that and eventually they go through that point, and then they hug the asymptotes. So they will do something like this. As k goes off to infinity. So there's our root locus sketch. And now let's check it. The way we'll check it is we'll just go down a couple pages and magically see a root locus that was created by MATLAB. So here's our angle of departure from a k equals zero point. By the way, whenever you create these root locus plots from MATLAB, go ahead and label things and draw some arrows in. k equals zero. Boom, boom. k equal infinity k equal infinity, and there we have it. It's crossing the axis at 1.7. Beautiful. Here's our k equals zero points at negative one, plus or minus roughly 1.4j. Excellent. They bend off at negative 35 degrees from here, just like we calculated, and they have these asymptotes that if I were to draw some tangents, well, I intersected at 1. It should have been negative 2 thirds. Um, but that has to do with my inability to draw a tangent line to that curve. So there you have it. Just to summarize, we went through an example where we had a fairly rich set of the sketching rules, asymptotes, imaginary axis intercepts. But the only thing we didn't have was a break-in point. That is where the root locus enters into the real axis. Just didn't happen. So again, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and thanks for watching.